Hey guys, it's Pastor Scott. We're at Restart Church. About ready to get started. Enjoy. Share. Okay. Okay, godly people. We're going to start with prayer, huh? Amen. Yeah. Nothing, nothing can get done without prayer. Yeah. We don't get on our knees, get on those prayer bones and pay attention to stuff. How can we expect things to happen in our life that we can understand? Things are going to happen in our life. Amen. But whether we understand them, have understanding to apply the word of God and the word of truth to, to those circumstances, we'll be floating all around how we are. You bet. You bet we will. Well, let's start with prayer. Again. Heavenly Father, I just praise you for each heart in this place. Lord, we humble ourselves before you, Lord. We call upon your high and holy name, Lord God. Mercy now upon each one in this place. Help us to rejoice at the fact that we are celebrating Pentecost today. Help us to rejoice for the down payment of the eternal glory that yes. you've given to reside, to dwell in our hearts. Yes. Yes. Mercy now upon each heart. Mercy now upon each of us, Lord Father, and help us learn from you and your word and your word only. May it empower us to give us peace, sanctify us, set us apart, O Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Right before we begin to have a, a song, I want to put a few things forward. First, I want to welcome Pastor Scott and his fine guy. Jesus! Oh my! Woo! <laughs> wow! That was gnarly, Pastor Bob. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Pastor Jason, you've got me into that one. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That's what's up. Over here at the Valley Community 
church. He told them what? We will, he says he's going to wax us. I'm not sure what that phrase means. Okay? <laughs> right? And then I, I might uh, uh, talk to, to other churches in our area, maybe get the uh, Father Stanislaw uh, from uh, up the road here in that parish to take on uh, St. Matthews. Who knows? Amen. We'll get all this inner Christian stuff going on. Have Praise God. Eat a few hot dogs, it's going to be cool. So that's what's happening right there. That's where it's at. Uh, there's a sign right on front. In fact, that is the very sign. Thank you all for putting that up. And in fact, you just go, you'll grab these right out of here. Bring them back. Yeah. <laughs> just saying. I know how you roll. Come on now. He's in my car. Yeah. No, bring them back. <laughs> all right. So, yeah. now, why don't we stand together? Let's not forget that as we sing, we're preparing ourselves. We're preparing our hearts with worship and praise. After Jason. Brother. Yeah, you want to storm this tree knocked down, walk up in here. Yeah, gotcha. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. A lot of people are here and focused on a lot of things happening today. And as Christians, I think we can we should focus on them, but we focus on them the wrong way. We try to deal with it ourselves with the flesh, and we don't give it to God and ask for God to deal with it. We don't surrender ourselves to the Spirit so that He can do a work in us. Mm -hmm. He's the one doing the work yes. through us. And that's what we need today. Yes. Amen. We worship, let's just remember it's not about you and I, it's not about how it sounds, it's not about how good a singer you are. Right. God wants you as you are because He's going to take you where He's going to take you. Mm -hmm. So let's surrender to that. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for your word. We're thankful, God, that a God that is so above us and beyond us. Lord, we are, we are smaller than a speck on your giant blueprint, yet you tell us in Hebrew that there's no place we can hide from you. Mm. Nowhere we can hide. You're watching us. Mm. Lord, that you love each of us. You don't show favoritism, Lord. You, it's just incredible that a God so outside of this place and outside of our understanding would love us beyond anything we can understand. Mm. We just ask for your presence here, God, move us to a new place today. Break us, Lord, break our hearts. Mm -hmm. What breaks yours, let us see what you see. And just drive us to be just so loving and graceful and truthful in today where all those things are just so absent. Mm -hmm. Help us, Lord. We surrender ourselves to you. We give you this worship and you bless you. Amen. Amen.
Bible says that you're the leader in the household. Amen. Amen. But as you sing and worship, I mean, your wife has an angelic voice. We know that. But then when you, when you demonstrate your love for Christ in worship, in prayer, in reading, in teaching, man, your household's going to change. That's Amen. Right. Amen. So I challenge you, man, that even if you can't sing or you don't like to sing, you know, there's a lot of things I don't like doing. But God has called me to do those Thank things. Amen. So I'm going to do it. Yep. I'm going to do it. Yep. But this song talks about what Jesus did for us. All the side of the grave, right? Yes.
have trouble singing that song because I find myself tearing up. Yeah. Yeah. Just think what he did. Amen. Think what he's doing. God is in the present active tense. He's powerful. He's powerful right now. Right this instant. You know, I think we should pray right now. Heavenly Father, I just honor you and thank you for your mercies. I give you, Lord Father, glory about what we're going to hear. I pray, Lord God, that our hearts will be united to fear your high and holy name, that what transpires in these next few minutes, Lord, I honor you and give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. I was going to pray for a road crew to move my pulpit, but you see how it goes. Another piece of small church. No. <laughs> Lord heal. Pentecost. Pentecost. Wow. Familiar names to a lot of us, right? Yes. It's a, it's a big happening, right? God gave you the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. It was something that he did. That's what God's going to get a close up to me. Yeah, ain't I no. I should have struck a little closer. Yeah. My ears and stuff. <laughs> you know, to get a good understanding of Pentecost, though, it's going to be important for us to drop back into the Old Testament. Into the Old Testament and discuss the feasts of Israel. You notice there? What's the name of that critter there that's on your right hand side? What's that called? Menorah. Menorah. Did someone say Menorah? That would be the correct response. Now, sometimes you'll see, uh, this is, it has seven lamps. You'll see them with nine lamps also. Some controversy about the nine lamps. Basically, that's a Hanukkah. Uh, menorah, kind of specialized, and as the one that was in the temple, this is a, a relief done by the Babylonians as they drug the temple contents into Babylon, and you can see there a seven uh, oil lamp uh, menorah that they drug. Notice what's conspicuous, there is not one, nay, not one relief drawing of the Ark of the Covenant in Babylon. Interesting enough. All right, let's get busy here. There's seven feasts of Israel. Three in the spring that I think we need to kind of chat about here real quick, okay? Now, the Passover is what? That's where the Jews were in Egypt as slaves. Slaves of sin, like us, like you and me. And the angel of death came upon uh, Egypt, and if they sprinkled the blood on the doorpost and lentil, that house was free. And the angel of death did what? He passed over. Did he left them? And and also, it's noteworthy to know that the exact time of the pa of the Passover is uh, the time that we call Easter, the time of the Passion, the time of Christ, and he was our Passover lamb. Concurrent with that feast, then, is the ten-day celebration of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Unleavened. Unleavened means it's yeast. It takes the yeast out of the bread. This, was, this is unleavened for two reasons. One, that they didn't have time in Egypt to cook up a loaf. It was the bread of haste. Secondly, yeast is a picture of what? It's a picture of sin. It's a picture of sin. Why is that? It's a picture of sin because what, is, what does yeast do? It puffs up. It makes one feel important. And that's the original sin, pride. What did Satan say? I shall be like the Most High God. And so they ate unleavened bread as a picture then of, of, of being mindful to remove sin in our life. And then the third, the third feast there is so critical for us to understand as a New Testament church. Because as we know, the Hebrew tradition in the Old Testament is what? Always, the, what's their high day? Saturday. That's the Sabbath day, right? But on, on the Feast of First Fruits, they took the barley loaf from the, from the first fruits of the harvest, and on Sunday, the priest would go before the Lord and wave.
that to the Lord as an honoring. This is the first fruits of the harvest. But at the same time, the first fruit of Jesus Christ came from the dead and was walking alive. Woo! Yeah. He was the first fruit from the dead. At the very same time, on that Sunday, he was alive and walking, having defeated death. A beautiful picture. But now let's move on to, to where uh, Pentecost comes into play. The next feast is called the Feast of Weeks. Kind of a curious name, is not Feast of Weeks. There's some very specific uh, things that they had to pay attention to. And here's the book of Leviticus. Now, Leviticus makes a good read. Huh. <laughs> pay attention. Lots of coffee. You know, all these kids have been locked up in their houses doing this remote learning. And it's a bear, isn't it? You're sitting there like this, looking around, falling asleep in front of your math book. Imagine Leviticus, that's a reading for you. But notice what it says. Let's read this together. You're going to count for yourselves from the day, what? After the Sabbath, when, what? When you brought that sheep. To the time that priest on that Sunday waved the sheep of, the, of, the, of that first fruit, you're going to count seven Sabbaths. Well, it's one Sabbath a week, 49 days. How's the math going on there? I should have asked my granddaughter. That's a little math quiz for you. She'd have got it, though. She's a smart one that way. And, and notice something else that's very important. You're going to count 50 days, he says, to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and you're going to present yet another new grain offering to the Lord. So that's uh, where the Greek word, uh, that's where we get the word Pentecost. That's 50. But notice it says, to the day after. That puts it back on Sunday again. It, it distinguishes uh, uh, the, the Jewish tradition, the Levitical tradition, from the Sabbath being the key day until the next day. Now, is that important? Oh, yes, I believe it's very important. Why? First off, the Feast of Weeks is celebrated on Sunday, isn't it? That's true. And, and instead of waving a sheep, they actually bake loaves. Two loaves of bread. And they were made with yeast. They were made with yeast. So if we take that picture of unleavened bread and carry it forward to this feast, that means the person comes as they are with sin. And there's two of them. Now, now follow with me here. It's real important. Uh, and he takes these two loaves and he waves them, a wave offering before the Lord. Now look at this last piece. There's also two sacrifices made. One as a sin offering. And then two separate sacrifices for what? For fellowship. And to me, and my point of view on this, this is we're not going to start a new church over this. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. For I determined to know among you only Christ and you crucified. That's, That's all right. we got going in this place. That's right. <clears throat> One was a split. Christ was our sin offering. And the two loaves, in my point of view, means fellowship between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Between the Judaic custom and the, and the gift of the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles, which is celebrated when? On Pentecost. Turn your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, there's like 500 Bibles back there. And we'll get one in your hands if you want one. Put your hands up. <coughs> uh, Larry, can I ask you, well, that's Riley's going to fetch them up. Riley, grab about five of them and, and, and see if people would, would want one. If you don't have a Bible, Riley's going to hand you a Bible, and you take that Bible home with you. That's a gift for Restart Church. Amen. Bible. Woo! That's, a Bible. that's what's up. And a boy, Riley. I thought he's got all the people that said that Bible right Amen. I'd be very proud if you took all those Bibles home, Riley. We're taking these Bibles home. All right, Riley. <laughs> Amen. Good, Good man. man. Riley attends Bozeman. Acts chapter 2, and here's what it says. Let's, let's go through this together, right? Uh, 2, verse 1. This is reading out of King James. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they all, they were all with one accord in one place. Now hold it, time out. You got to go through the Bible with your lead shoes on. You can't be screaming verse to verse. You got to slow down. So let's take a look at this verse slowly. slowly. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were what? They were with one accord. Now we know how this story goes, don't we? We know the Holy Spirit's going to come upon these people, but look where they were. They were with one accord. They were harmonious. They were prepared. Just as we, right now, this instant in this place, are prepared. We have prepared our hearts through praise music. We have prepared our hearts through prayer. And we are ready to hear the word of God. That's 
how they were. And what happened? Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing or a mighty wind. Woo. Isn't that sound cool? And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Amen. Now, I have seen picture after picture and diorama after diorama of these guys standing outside uh, outside in the middle of the temple <laughs> and, and when all this miracle happened. Yep. But they were in a house sitting down. Sitting down, yep. And I think that's important. Why? Because they were gathered together in harmony. They were in one place and, and they were awaiting the power of God. But, but, the, but check this out. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. A couple of things to note there. As the Spirit guides, so goes the speech. Amen. We don't want to be in a spot where we're blabbing stuff off, right? I mean, Pastor Bob blabbing. If you hear me blabbing up there, you raise your hand and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's get back on Bible ground. You point that right out, because that's what we're about in this place. Look what happens. The, when, and what, look at the King James. you got to love this right here. When this was noise to broad. That's <laughs> so cool. Right? I challenge all of you to use that phrase in a sentence today with somebody you don't know. <laughs> I think they'll pay close attention to you. Noise when to broad. this was noise to broad, the word got out, the multitude came together, and they were confounded. They were confounded. But why were they confounded? What was it that made them wonder? Because every man heard them speak in his own language. Amen. The tongue that was given to the New Testament church was to be understood by others. As Paul says later on in the word, right? It's like a clanging bell, like a rack, if, if there's no one there to interpret it and to understand it, right? They were right. amazed. They marveled. They were amazed and they marveled. Wow, how hear we every man in our own tongue wherewith we're born. I'd like to just take a little sidebar here because we're going to talk about the functions of the Holy Spirit today. That's, that's going to be the title of what we're about. It's real important to know that tongue also means language and that there's communication. Notice, too, that they were in the house and, and the people were drawn to them. This was not a divisive issue. Uh, the speaking in the tongue was not something that separated people. You go, you go here, you go there. But it drew people to them. And, and, and there was an exchange of communication. There was a coming together. Now, in our modern world, we do have churches that identify themselves as full gospel. And I'm, I'm all about that. But if it's causing a, a division, or you're saying, oh, by the way, you're not this way, Therefore, you must be going to hell, or if you're that way, it's, it's the same, a similar kind of taste in my mouth. Uh, it leads with this whole idea of this new prophetic word that's out there, that big old church out on, in California, a guy starts with a J. He's out there saying, hey, I got a word for you, I'm a prophet. Well, if, if the prophecy becomes the point of, of the message, then you're losing the message. Yep. You speak to me out of the word of God, I'm all ears. That's all I really need you to do for me, right? And the same thing with Hebrew roots. A movement that's going on. It's causing division here, division here, division here. It's not about that. For I determined to know among you only Christ and in Christ. Amen. Amen. That's all that matters. Hey, Amen. there are two lines. A line full of sheep and a line full of goats. Yes. That's right. That's it. Yes. And our job is to reduce the line of goats. That's right. Make that, make that line smaller. That's the only thing that matters. Doesn't matter if you're if you sprinkle or if you're a baby dunker. It doesn't matter what, what your policy is. Yeah. What matters is Jesus and Him crucified. That's right, brother. And the gift of the Holy Spirit does what I identified uh, was three basic things. You can identify twenty more, and I encourage you get in your Bibles, read this topic, find and discover things for yourself. But He interacted with believers with non-believers, and with the Lord Most High. Let's start together with believers. Now, I've got five things, five different points, five different aspects of how he interacts with believers. If you're a note-taker, and I hope you are, don't freak out if I go past this, because I'm going to come back to this particular slide on each of these uh, guys. And by the way, I didn't prepare a lunch for everybody, so I cut this all down to only one verse for each of these five. Otherwise, it's going to be Tuesday. There were so many verses. I just had to pair one off, pair one off, pair one off. So there will only be one verse supporting this, and one of your homework assignments is going to be 
when you leave this place, you go find verses that are populated to support this. The first thing that we can say about the Holy Spirit's interactions with the believer is what? That he shows the way to the truth. That's right. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will what? Guide you into some of the truth. He will guide you into partial truth. He will guide all. you into some things here and there that you may like and some things you may not like. No, it says all truth. All truth. Look at that operative word. For me, it's one of the operative words besides this, the amazing thing, that first off, he's coming. Amen. First off, that he came, and, and, and he's going to reside in here. Now, that is some <clears> stuff, <throat> man. That's some stuff. Holy God residing in you, that's something that's a mind blower right there. But it says that he's going to guide us. That's right. What does that mean? We need guiding. Mm. <laughs> If he's going to guide us into truth, that means I'm away from truth. If he's going to guide me along the narrow path, that means I'm on the broad path that leads to destruction, right? So one of the beautiful things that the Holy Spirit does is what? He shows the way of truth to us. He demonstrates that. Secondly, one of the things uh, that I, I find most important in my personal walk with Christ is this second point right here, is that he brings words to remembrance, God's words. The helper, look at that beautiful name. Isn't that a wonderful name? The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Now, these are all like little parentheses, right? Or there's commas everywhere here. And all these things are building up to my point about remembrance, which happens to be the last line of that verse, right? But each one of those things are just right with me, just full. It's a beautiful, beautiful verse. And what's he going to do? He's going to teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Hmm. So, if he's going to bring to remembrance things that Christ said, what does that necessitate? We must be studying the things of what Christ said. Yeah. You've got to sit in front of the book. You've got to sit in front of your Bible each and every day. How is he going to bring to remembrance stuff that you haven't read? Amen. How is he going to remind you of stuff that you aren't alert to? We're, we've been slack. We're falling on our faces. I know I do. We can't live like that anymore. We have to release the power of the Holy Spirit in us by, by opening the Word and sitting in front of it and getting the Word of, of truth in us. The Word of God is what alive, active, sharper than any truth in short. It's alive. It's a living document. And it's going to influence me, and then I'll be able to remember. And what's important about that? Well, we're going to talk about that right now. Because the Holy Spirit also offers what? Individual instruction. <clears throat> Read this verse. This is out of Holman Christian standard here. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. He's going to take from what is mine. Now that's a broader reach in my view than the word of God. Jesus is talking. He's going to take stuff what's mine. Well, God's pretty big. He's bigger than even just our Bibles, right? And he's going to take from what is mine. What does that mean to me? To me, it means my understanding of truth. And I'm going to talk to you. Not only will you have that Bible verse percolating on your head back here, but he's going to teach you to apply that. Amen. To your needs, to the needs of somebody else. We're on the planet to serve. We're here to serve. And if our, we have our radar up and we're looking around and we see a need and, we, and there's a need to be met, we don't take our Bibles and here, have a Bible sandwich. Boom! And hit them over the head with it. No! We serve them. We observe the condition they're in. And God then, through the Holy Spirit speaking to us individually during that circumstance, will give you the understanding to apply the word of God to that need. Amen. That's what that is. And it's so cool because he does that for all of us. <clears throat> Fourth point. He promotes testimony to other people in us. When the advocate comes, advocate, how about that word? That's a great word. Make that citation. Make that citation. Note it. And you look up the word advocate. You think about lawyers. What do advocates do? That's rich right there. You can, you can think on that and run on that for a long time. You work that verse over. Whom I will send to you from the Father. There's that, there's that sending off. There's that commissioning. People who go into the military and they get commissioned. Right? Active Congress, officer and gentleman, these paper comes your direction and you've been commissioned, you've been sent out. The spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will what? He's going to testify about Christ. The Holy Spirit is going to testify about Jesus. 
Well, how's he going to do that? Well, certainly he'll testify to me. Wake up, Bob. You're, you're heading the wrong direction, right? That part's all in there. But, you know, he's going to testify to others. And no. how's he going to do that? Us. That's, that's, how, that's this testimony of the Lord God. The testimony of the Spirit about God comes through our mouths and our actions. He's going to testify. He's going to promote the testimony to other people, the testimony of God. And, and then the last point with respect to interactions with you and I as peeps is he's going to confer power and comfort. This is Jesus' words in Acts. But you will receive what? Some kind of dulcetory slap on the back, a little certificate, gold watch. Uh -uh. Church membership. Nope. You're going to receive Power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses. Where is he witnesses? First, you start in Jerusalem. You start with you. You've got to get this thing squared away. You've got to get on your prayer bones, talk to Jesus about your own stuff. And then the next step out is what? Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the earth. Then, then go talking out here. But half our problem, half the things I hear on these podcasts, which I don't listen to anymore, is these guys mm -hmm. talking all about themselves. And I follow this guy. Oh, yeah, I listen to that preacher out of Idaho. And this guy, Ugh. you listen to Jesus and you put your nose in the book. That's right. That's what's going to make the difference in all our lives, right? And we're going to receive power, the scripture says. Look at this. These are the last two weeks we've been studying here about uh, John chapter 15. And we got through uh, five weeks of study. We're on verse three. <laughs> I got to be the worst preacher you ever saw. I think by the time we finish the chapter, Jesus Himself will be here speaking. <laughs> Amen. Let's hope so. But the last two weeks we talked about abiding and the components of abiding. You can't do these things without power. No. You can't live the life of Jesus without power from God. Without the energy, insight, wisdom, understanding from God himself speaking to you through the Spirit. This is how God operates to dwell with him, to accompany him, to make the changes that we need to make in our life. To know what it is that he wants us to do. To love others as he has loved. And then to get away from sinful habits. These are the insights that we have that help us overcome. This is from last week. Do I hate the thing God hates? What about the world, worldly pursuits? Am I after that? Do I use my willpower to say I'm going to do the right thing? Or am I tolerant of having a sidecar over here so it's not to sin, right? You can't do these things without power. It's not going to happen. We said that he's, he confers power, and he also does what? He confers comfort to us. For as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, oh, oh, let's stop. Don't you feel the sufferings of Christ are overflowing on you? Don't you feel overwhelmed? Haven't things been happening in your personal lives through some of this isolation business and, and the difficulties of communicating with other people, being part of other people? Um, I heard Miss Tammy said, what am I supposed to do? I'm a hugger. <laughs> right? That kind of that's a that kind of typifies. Typifies? That's not a word, is it? It typifies watching her. <laughs> Type to find. <clears throat> but see, as the sufferings come, so through Christ, through the Holy Spirit of God, our comfort does what? It overflows. The Holy Spirit of God looks to comfort you. Not just a little bit. Not just in some vague way that you feel a sense of inspiration over here and you're okay with that. But he overflows. His comfort is overflowing to you. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what he wants to do with us. Those are some of, just some of the interactions with believers. Go look up your own. Go dig in your Bibles and find other things for yourself. Make them your own. By the way, all these notes are put on our website uh, as a sermon guide, as a study guide for all the sermons we've done in this little, little church for ours. All my sermon notes are in here. Go to the website, you pop on the sermon library, you go there, and you listen to the old guy if you want to hear the video, or go through them, just read the notes. You 
give you reminders of the verses we, we did. Amen. Secondly, how we interact, interact with non-believers. This verse is very key, very critical. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Jesus specifically says, I'm going to name three important roles that the Holy Spirit's going to do. And notice the word reprove. <clears throat> In order for something to be reproved, what is necessary? It has to be proved. It first must be proved. The world is going to think a certain way about these three topics. It's going to think a certain way about sin. It's going to see a certain way about righteousness. It's going to see and think a certain way about judgment. The New American Standard uh, Version uh, uses that word, convicts. He will convict the world. Well, how will he convict the world of sin? Well... He, he, uh, John goes on to write that he's going to convict the world of sin because they don't believe. You're driving down the road, okay? You're driving down the road, and you go as fast as you want. And then someday, somebody from the city comes in and puts a 35 mile an hour sign. Well, how about a 25 mile an hour sign down here? Amen. I'm sure all you rode 25 when you came down to the cemetery today. <laughs> wow. Why so bad? Listen to that. So now all of a sudden, I got a road sign that tells me the way I should go. The reason the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin because the sacrifice of Christ is the road sign, the identification for sin. And they reject the Holy Spirit. They reject Jesus. Therefore, they are reproved about their own idea of sin. Right? That's the first thing. Second thing he does is he convicts and reproves the world of righteousness. And the reason he does that, according to John, is that because Jesus goes to the Father. Well, how does that fit together? Well, what happened to Jesus when he went to the Father? Is he standing or is he sitting? Did someone say sitting? Mm -hmm. Gold stars all around. He is seated at the right hand of God. He's seated. His work is done. Now, he's going to come back. Y'all come get us. And there's going to be a battle that will all ride on again. Horses. You yep. horses. Yeah. Well, Revelation says you're going to have your happy biscuit sit down one. Mm -hmm. You'll be riding a horse. Hope you like horses. <laughs> and, and we'll be on these horses led by Jesus. Ain't going to be much of a battle because the scripture says that God's just going to burn the whole horse up and hang up all the food. <laughs> but the point remains he's gone to the Father. <clears throat> Part of the, of the thing with some of these other offshoots, our friends who are doing Hebrew roots, our friends who get off on these other tangents, they think the righteousness must be added to. There are things that you must add to righteousness in order to become close to God. You have to behave a certain way and do a certain thing. No, the scripture doesn't promise that. No, it doesn't teach that all. It says we need to become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Amen. He's it. Because Jesus went to the Father, what did he say on the cross? It is finished. finished. There's no more to add to it. There's not a word to say or that word or a pronoun to add to it. And the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world that by all its activities and things, forget it. Christ is resting. It's done. Second thing, or the third thing he's going to do, he's going to reprove the world of judgment. Why? Because the ruler of this world has been judged. So what is the world view of judgment? You tell me. What does the world think about making judgments? It doesn't. Right. Unless it's against Christians. Yes. Right. That's right. They, don't, they don't judge themselves right like we judge ourselves. No. It's okay. I got this big old gray area. There is my judgment. It's okay. I behave this way. It's okay. I do that because I'm not messing with you. That's not God's standard. Do I understand it? Yes. Have I lived that way? Yes, I have. I confess to you, brothers and sisters, I sure have. I should have. Because uh, the judgment is the judgment of God. And the ruler of the world, the devil himself, has been judged. All the evil, all the wickedness of the unseen world has been cast down, thrown away. He's already been defeated. The value system, the value stream and structure of the world has been cast aside. And the Holy Spirit saying, I've already judged what you hold important. Your standard is not God's standard. All judgment has been given over to Christ. It all belongs to Jesus. That's how the world will be reproved. But now, that sounds rough, but don't worry. The Holy Spirit also wants to love people too. God didn't even look at this verse right here. The Lord's not slow about his promises. Some count slowness. But it's patient. Wishing for who? 
not wanting anybody to perish, but all to come to repentance. How does the Holy Spirit work in the world? He reproves the world. He stands up straight and says, by the way, here are some things that you need to work on. This is the value system. This is the strength of your design. This is what you're made to do. But also, but also, even if you're in that spot, I still die for you. I still love you. And I'm calling you to myself. I'm calling you to myself. Come to me. Come to me. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose hearts are completely his. He is looking for people to turn to him. So the Holy Spirit, the way he acts with others is, is, is like that. So how about some interaction with the Most High God? I have three things I thought about how the Holy Spirit uh, works with God to our men. The first is he intercedes with God for us. This is a long verse, Romans uh, uh, chapter 8, uh, 26, so I'll um, let you read it in a minute. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. I need some help. <laughs> <Don't you? clears throat> Loveth the King Jameth. Right? For we know not what we should pray for as we are. Look at that. We don't even know how to pray like we should pray. And, and, and Paul is referring to that, to the Roman church, as an infirmity, as something uh, that's, that, that's almost like a sickness or a disease, that, an insufficiency, better word, insufficiency. And, and that we need to pray as we ought. But he says, tell you what, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make intercession for you with groanings that cannot be uttered. What a word. New American Standard says, groanings too deep for words. Right now, in this place, in your spirit, the spirit of God is groaning in you, talking to the Father. Right now, this moment, all of you, if, if we had our spiritual ears really tuned in, we'd hear all of that. We'd be such beautiful music. But see, that is an important learning for you and I, that the Holy Spirit is interceding for God, and it leads us to say, I need to pay more attention to my prayer life. We'll touch on that momentarily. But he also empowers God's will. All right, she's coming forward. <laughs> oh, we had one coming forward on the aisle. Amen. Oh. Bring him, Jesus. <clears throat> yeah, God bless you. That little girl is setting an example for all of us coming up here to make a confession, huh? Amen. Right. He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints According to the will of God. Amen. So the Holy Spirit is fussing with you and I according to the will of God. I wonder what God's will is for my life. Do I turn to the right? Do I turn to the left? What kind of career? I have a discussion with my grandson. What kind of career will I be doing? What school will I go to? Where do I go from here? How do I get out of all this financial issue that I'm in? How do I repair this relationship? All these issues, all these things. But guess what? <laughs> The Holy Spirit, right now, one of his job, he's talking to God about that. On your behalf. That's what the intercessor does. He's, he's dealing with the Lord about the thing you're disturbed about. He's talking to, to the Lord about the thing that has you upside down. And he's going to talk to you according to the will of God. He's not going to lead you astray. In fact, he might point out stuff in your thinking that's a little messed up. Right? That's what he does. And then we got to stand up a little straight and say, okay, I need to turn. The Greek word for confess is to turn, turn around, show me your face, but no, we turn our back on God, right? So he intercedes, intercedes for the saints. And then here's a, here's a really cool verse and the last point I'd like to make. He reflects God's character. When he, when he disagreed, verse out of Isaiah. I'll make a notation of this for you. I have a little star in your Bible in this citation, please. He's talking about the Messiah. The anointed one. The chosen one. Not like I'm the major soul. He's the chosen one. Where did they get all that? They get it right out of the Bible, of course. Jesus is the anointed one. And here's what it says about him. That there'll be, there'll be six things, six truths about Christ. Now, look, let me put them in a line like this so you can see them a little more clearly. See, there's a spirit of wisdom in him. The spirit of wisdom. And the Holy Spirit is going to reflect this to you and I. 
that we need to act in wisdom. And, and then understanding is what? So understanding is the application of wisdom. How, how many times have you heard it said, well, he's full of head knowledge, but he can't change a tire? <laughs> right? So the understanding piece that's there. Counsel, being available. Hey, counseling is listening. If I had a dime for every married couple uh, that I had an opportunity to sit and been blessed with sitting in front to offer a word of encouragement to about what was happening in their marriage, I think I think listening would be right at the top of the list. Amen. He's not hearing me. He's not listening. Why well, am but just hurry out? We need to listen closely. The spirit of counsel, strength. There's back this power again, right? This, we're not wimpy. Christians aren't wimpy. The person who thinks a Christian is a pushover in the Christian life that's easy is not a Christian. Only the believer knows how tough it is to be a believer. The knowledge of God and then fear of the Lord. I want to touch on this last one before we close. You got I told my wife, I've told anyone who stands still long enough to listen to me. This is a burden standing up here. I get nervous. My hands are sweaty. I, I, I have a problem in the morning. I, I groan. I'm afraid to be up here because I'm talking to you folk about God. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and Jesus is going to look me in the eye and say, man, were you on your knees when you prepared this message? Or did you just take something quick that you knew you could just blab out that what ain't happening? I'm afraid of God. I'm afraid of the consequences of me anyone here and saying a word that isn't true from his word. You don't need to hear from me. You don't need to hear from Pastor Sluggo on your iPad. You don't need to hear a broadcast uh, around the world. What you need is Jesus. Day by day, word by word, Bible verse by Bible verse. Fear the Lord. If we fear the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. You want to know what to do on a step you're taking? Boy, if I take this step, am I showing pride? Am I showing avarice? Am I showing... And you go through the motivations that you have and you ask the Holy Spirit who will enlighten you. Why? Because he's interceding with God to give you the vision of God's will for you. And you go through these things. No, these characteristics seem to be in place. The Lord is... is uh, okay, Lord, I can go for it because I'm doing it out of fear, out of reverence, out of respect for you. Very important insight into God's character. Those, those are some interactions uh, with the Lord Most High. Okay, we're going to take a little moment here. I'm going to have to, the praise band come up. And I'd just like you to, to sit with me a minute. And, and, and let's get a little personal in your own mind. Okay? It says that the scripture says here that, uh, that it, 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 we, we saw in the scripture about the interaction of the Holy Spirit with us in showing the way to the truth. The showing to the way of, of truth. How about you? Are you finding yourself in that spot where you're doing just that? Are you looking to the way of truth in your life? Are you, are you hearing him when, he, when he tells you, hey, listen, this is the way, walk in it, whenever you turn to the right or to the left. Are you, are you doing that? Are you listening to that? It's so important, right? How about, how about bringing to remembrance the word of God? Well, how can we bring to remembrance the word of God if we're not reading that book? We have got to read the book. You've got to read the Word of God. It's the way. It's the roadmap. It's how He talks to us. Oh, I haven't got time. You, you, it's the most important thing you can do. The most important advantage of those things. It's not about that. But it's about a success in here. Who are you turning into? Are you turning more Christ-like in the way that you look at things? That's the question for you, right? Am I listening to the Holy Spirit at all for individual instruction? You see, you hear that voice when you're standing in the line at Smith's and God says, hey, why don't you make a remark to this person? Boy, they look sad. Make an encouraging remark, but then you don't do it. Can I pray for you? Is that kind of where you're at these days, right? <clears throat> how, about, how about sharing what you know with somebody else? Oh, I'm not saying go door to door, although going door to door, door, door is an okay thing. We've done that. Knock down a few doors here and there, right? That's okay. It's not quite as acceptable. But, but to, be, uh, to be a witness to somebody, to share with somebody you, that you don't know, who can't pay you back? Are you living in power? Would you say that your life is a powerful life? That the spiritual part of you is powerful? Now, you might have a, uh, that 
So I've never been anybody like Josh Burge on the board where it comes down putting his head straight down on the ground. You guys are total savage. He works till two in the morning. I, that's a work ethic I can't relate to, frankly. But I'll say this, from a spiritual standpoint, you might have Josh Burge on. Am I following after Christ from a spiritual standpoint? Amen. Where I put my teeth in the ground and I do his job right, like this guy, Walter. The job's done correctly when he does it. So those are some interactions with us. But what about other people? What about other people? Am I living a life so that they see what sin really is by me not sinning? That's right. Am I distinctive enough in my walk? Am I particular enough in who I am that I can convict or reprove the idea of sin because of who I am? Or do I act I'm under my own righteousness? Or do I reflect the righteousness of Christ? <laughs> ah, that's how we convict the world in our life, right? And judgment. Am I judgmental? Am I, am I telling tales on other people? These guys stink because they think this way. That guy's a schmo because he thinks that way. Oh, I know more about the Bible than this guy, so I'm going to argue about this or I'm going to argue about that. Hey, who cares if the earth is flat or if they landed on the moon or by wearing a mask you're more likely to spread than COVID? Who cares? For I determined to know among you only Christ and him crucified. And then lastly... When, when we think of the Holy Spirit, do you vision the Holy Spirit in you actually talking to God on your behalf? Stop and think about that. He's talking to God on your behalf. He's interceding for you with groanings, too deep for words. Things going on that you can't even begin to understand the words that he's using because he's so powerful and beautiful. That's something else. So let's have a little prayer together right now, and then we'll stand and sing. But hold on right now uh, in your seat. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, on our knees emotionally, Lord God. We come before you on our knees spiritually. We pray, Lord God, that at this time we would lay before you the stuff in our life that's between you and I, Lord. And that we push it away. That we push it away, Father, because we don't want any part of it anymore. Because we want Jesus left. We're going to put on that altar uh, our objectives, our goals, our possessions, our rights. And, and, and we're going to let you administer our life. We're going to let you be the one who points out, to supervise and to superintend who we are, where we go, the belongings that we have, the possessions that we have, that we yearn for you and understand that we are your possession, precious. So precious that you died for us. Holy Spirit, thank you for the beautiful gift that you are and that you dwell in our hearts. We pray mercy now, Lord, that we be worthy to receive, to receive that Holy Spirit, that it might grow in us. Holy Spirit, get a grip of us right now in this place like never before. Thank you, Jesus. Like never before. We bless you, Lord. That we live in power and strength and comfort in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. <clears throat> You are true, you are true, even in my 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon each and every one of you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit of God, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.